I am very proud to represent UTMB. I'm extremely proud to represent my department. When you have patients that have an option to go to the mainland and have to drive over about 40 miles to get to Galveston, there has to be a reason. The reason is the awesome uh, customer service that you will get and care from UTMB. It feels really good to know that I'm working at an institution that is helping train tomorrow's uh, healthcare leaders and in developing innovations in, in healthcare through biomedical research and helping people improve their lives, helping their, their overall well-being through our clinical care here on the island and on the mainland. It's just, it's a, it's an, it's a wonderful feeling. We believe we're helping the university um, further its, its cause to help the community. It's more than uh, just a job that we do. This is really a part of our values, something we believe in. So where we can help uh, clinics and um, researchers, all these people do their job, then we've done our job. Whether it be uh, the person planting new flowers or picking up trash. Although it may not seem like they play a part in that. It all comes together as a team. You have a nice mixture of people with a vast array of experiences that are able to all come together and be able to assist each other. It helps me to feel like I really am part of a team and part of a family. Without them, I could never pull it off. I could never do it without my team. It's not um, my success, it's our success. We really are pretty innovative. They're very receptive to open ideas from, you know, whether you're a rookie or you've been there 20 years. They are very um, supportive of education, training, and providing those opportunities. It's constantly embracing the lifelong learning goals. There are opportunities at the university. Really all you have to do is apply yourself be effective and efficient, and set some goals high. Along the way, I've been able to take advantage of tuition reimbursement, um, on-site training. Um, my boss is constantly giving me new things to learn. So I like being able to make a difference, and you know, that's one of the biggest parts. We enjoy what we do, so it's really easy to come to work. It, you know, when you love your job, it's not a job. It's just something you love to do and you want to come to. Who I am today is based on what UTMB has, what I have done at UTMB my whole career has been here. My life is a lot richer for having worked here. What do you guys think? Yeah. Well, thank you to everybody who was involved. And, you know, that's really what it's all about. It's about us, our people, what we do every day. It's a really, really big place. We all know there's a lot going on, but we're capable of doing a lot and achieving a lot because our people are so invested personally and professionally in what we do. And it's really, really great. It's what makes UTMB great, and it's what makes us so capable of responding to whatever the future will throw at us. So I'm really excited about that future. We're going to talk a little bit more about it today. I want to start with um, a little focus on a new web page. You know, we always have fun. We get a chance to talk with each other, to point out accomplishments of individuals or groups or recognition that we're receiving. And our marketing and communications folks have now begun to organize this into a couple of pages. So we'll show you one of the new ones. We'll go through some of the construction updates, uh, IT project updates, HR areas of uh, focus and priority, and then my assessment of where we stand with overall performance. And then close, again, with some thoughts about the future. This is that awards and accolades website. It's just come up. Where's Steve Campbell? There he is. Right, Steve, we just got this launched. We've been looking at a prototype for a few weeks. This is out there. You can see the um, website. And of course, we'll put these slides out there so you can come back and find this. But uh, we're focusing here on some of the accomplishments of the health system. We're adding in some individual awards and recognition. And we'll add to this over the course of time. So it's a great place where we can all go to remind ourselves about these things that are occurring. 
and to then use this as a source for when we talk to the people we work with about the great things that are happening at UTMB. So thanks, Steve, to our marketing communications folks, and thanks to everybody for doing such great work that's bringing increasing recognition to UTMB. All right, construction. We continue to talk about this. It's hard not to notice what's happening here on the campus or up at uh, Victory Lakes. Great progress. I think these photos were taken last Tuesday. So, and of course, we've made a little progress since then, too, but you can see that the exteriors are coming together nicely. The Ginny Seeley and the Clinical Services Wing, um, we're almost to the point where we can start beginning to at least imagine being completely closed in up at the Victory Lake Specialty Center Addition, the new inpatient hospital. In fact, I think we're going to celebrate the halfway there point with that facility next month. So a lot of work occurring, things on schedule for us to open and occupy the Jenny Seeley in early 2016. We'll occupy the clinical services wing in 2015, just a little bit in advance of the opening of the Jenny Seeley. Of course, we want to get all the support services located in here so that we can serve both the Jenny Seeley and the John Seeley as we go forward. And then we'll occupy this probably in somewhere between June and September of 2015. So again, great progress, things coming along nicely. Now, I talked, I think, in the last town hall meeting that I did, and I think Ms. Sollenberger talked a little bit about some of the new clinic spaces that we're developing. We have the space in Alvin. We've just begun the site work for that. We're hopeful that we can actually have that open by sometime in the fall. Texas City, a groundbreaking occurring next month, and then hopefully an opening sometime late in the calendar year or early in the next one. The new Galveston Pediatrics and Urgent Care site, which is here in Galveston uh, on the site of the Home Depot Target Center that's there at 61st and Broadway. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to break, uh, break ground on that facility in about September and then occupy it five to six months later. That's taken a little bit longer. That's a more complicated space. We actually had to get approval from Target and from Home Depot and the headquarters of all those other things that are there. They had to sign off on our um, lease agreement to go in there, but that's happened, so we're moving forward. And then we also have talked about the West Clinic behind the Randalls here on Galveston Island at 61st and Central City Boulevard. Uh, the Seely Smith Foundation will construct that set of facilities. The first phase is going to be about 30,000 square feet. They're looking now at beginning site work sometime in the next few months. So as we develop plans, the timelines really are created for the occupation of that space. We'll keep everybody informed. But obviously, beautiful new spaces well attuned to the sorts of care delivery that we provide, primary care and specialty uh, care at these sites. Uh, very exciting to have them available for us in the future as we expand our clinical operations. Um, Angleton Danbury, we mentioned, it's not just a facility, although the arrangement that's being proposed that we would have with the Angleton Danbury Medical Center would involve us leasing that facility, then operating it, assuming those employees. Um, a lot of exciting things about the partnership concept. You know, we've talked about what healthcare in the future looks like, about the concepts of population health, both for a general population as well as specialty spe specific populations. There's a lot of interest in more collaboration among existing groups of providers, so UTMB and our colleagues at Angleton Danbury. So this is a step forward for both organizations, thinking about how you build that sort of partnership, how we can continue to get really great primary and specialty care for the people who live in the Angleton Danbury area available to them locally, and how we can provide a, a backstop for more advanced services here over the course of time, how both organizations can work together for the mutual benefit of our patients. So we're very excited about that. We'll send that proposed agreement to our Board of Regents at their next meeting in May, and hopefully we'll be moving forward after that. So a nice development for us. Um, I know that if you're here on the campus that you've been impacted 
by the infrastructure project, the distribution system progress. And, and I've been actually really bothering Mike Schreiner about getting the dates for me so I could post those for the slides so you guys could see because invariably when I talk about this, somebody says, when are you going to finish that project? <laughs> well, it's going to be a little while longer, but you can see from the dates it's not too bad. So we've got things that vary from beginning in September of 2014, I guess actually July over here, and then sort of progressing around over the course of the, of the next couple of years. Now the tough thing about this, you all know you've seen this in progress, is it's underground work. Remember, we, the, the, the contractor essentially digs holes, they drop in the boring machines, the tunnels are bored for the placement of the new delivery system, and that's because it's underground. Of course, weather can have a huge impact on the progress, as well as the fact that we're only as good in planning the route of that uh, as we can be based on the maps of what's under there already. And invariably, when you do a project like this underground, we discover that something is missing from those maps or that the as-built configuration is not as the as-mapped configuration suggests it should be. So anyway, these dates are approximate, but they do give you a sense for what's happening with this huge project that will essentially offer significant protection against the sort of damage that we suffered with Ike to our steam systems. So excited to see this moving forward. Uh, Mike, we won't hold you to these exactly, but thank you for being willing to go out on a limb and say these are the approximate dates for completion of the various phases of this important project. Uh, switching gears a little bit to IT, um, our IT folks are just amazing, just like our facilities folks. You know, I, I've never seen Todd really break a sweat. Now, I don't know what he does behind closed doors, but they always seem like they've got everything really in control. You know, they're really cool. And that's despite the fact that they've got so much going on all the time. Now, occasionally I have noticed when I've said, hey, Todd, would you mind, you know, adding this to your list? He says, oh, I don't know, we'll think it'll be okay. Okay, fine. <laughs> and his voice drops back down to, anyway, they're doing incredible work, a lot of great things happening. The clinical systems, you know, constantly being upgraded. Every time Epic comes out with a new version, there are a lot of desirable aspects of service associated with that new version, and we want to get them implemented as quickly as we can. They're currently completing that EPIC 2012 version upgrade, continuing to install the specialty-specific modules like the Phoenix transplant model that's currently being installed. A lot of work, obviously necessary in terms of supporting the meaningful use and value-based purchasing effort. Uh, the, you know, we essentially have to comply with these mandates to get paid fully for the clinical work that we're doing, and it requires huge support from our IT group. So they're currently um, completing the barcode medication administration uh, implementation, and also the EPIC health maintenance uh, piece is going in. I think this is the one that sends a note to us as providers about things that may be due for our patients. So that's really cool. Reminders coming along say, you know, your calendar, your patient needs this or that study done for their next visit. So that will be helpful also, particularly as we begin to think more about population health. A uh, new scholarship application going in, which moves to a single website where all of our students can go to apply for scholarships. Previously, it's been a very distributed process. Our students might not know where to go, where to look, or we might not be able to give them advice in as timely manner as we would like. So this pulls everything to one website with a lot of links and makes it easier for our students, hopefully makes it easier for them to access all of the different forms of scholarship support that are available to them. The clinical trials management system is bringing together our grants management system, uh, elements of the people, soft financial system, as well as some portions of EPIC, which support clinical trials. I think the latter will continue to be, uh, portion, portions of EPIC will be brought online that support our clinical trials management effort. But a lot of great work occurring with the implementation of that system. 
Um, we have a significant project underway looking at how we refine and improve our overall budget process for the institution, which brings us to using one form of the Hyperion software across all of the different components. So it's nice to see that move forward. And finally, the campus television upgrade. I think our TV technology is like decades old now. And so we'll actually move to modern streaming video, video on demand, which would be great if you want to watch a movie maybe in your office. I guess I shouldn't say that. <laughs> More importantly, if we want to deliver on-demand patient education in a clinic or in a, in a hospital room, we'll be able to do that with this new digital technology. So that, that's a big improvement. Thanks to our IT folks, you can actually go to this website if you want to see this huge list of their priorities. We've just shown a portion of it here. It identifies a start date as well as a proposed end date, and then the colors have meaning relative to the original plans versus new plans, and again, giving us an idea about the duration of particular projects. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Again, hats off to our IT folks, just as is the case with our facilities folks, for great work in helping move a significant agenda forward. In terms of HR, Dr. McKinley can't be here with us today. He's on jury duty. But uh, I know we have representatives from HR here. Dr. Barrett's here, and so he'll be able to answer any questions you have about uh, specific uh, elements of their plans and progress. A lot of work going on relative to performance management. And of course, that ties to this concept of my road ahead, where we all better understand and can describe what each of us does to contribute to UTMB's success. And of course, that involves a lot of thought, a lot of planning about what any single work group does, about what air, an area of the institution does and how that translates to the individual level, and along with that, having a development plan that identifies a set of skills development or personal development opportunities for every employee. So this e-performance module is a step towards better management of performance planning. It'll be accessible through the employee self-service and the manager self-service links on our website. It offers a step-by-step, -step, step, fairly intuitive approach to creating performance management documents and evaluations. So hopefully we'll move to more of a, a single um, evaluation tool that will be easier to use. We'll all get comfortable with that over the course of time and be able to do a better job of performance planning for every employee. Diversity continues to be an area of focus for that, for us. Uh, diversity has been important to us since our founding. When we talk about diversity being a core value, about how much we rely on diversity of thought and backgrounds to bring different perspectives so we can create better solutions to complex problems. We always want to make sure we're doing everything that we can do to attract all the different sorts of people with those backgrounds and those perspectives that we need to be successful. So we'd like to do a little bit more surveying about what's happening locally. At the institutional level, we're doing some really nice things. We also know that we have some gaps. But what about at the work unit level? What's happening? What do our people see? What suggestions can be created from a larger set of input points? So we're going to develop, or we are going to use this uh, D diversity climate survey to try to get some of that information and incorporate the feedback into our diversity strategic plan. There's a manager development program which has been in development, will roll out with the beginning of the next fiscal year. We've heard a lot from our managers that they would like more structured planning more of a curriculum related to management or maintenance of a lot of the skills that we use as managers. So we'll have this ready to go. I'm excited about this. Everything from conflict management to performance planning management and the like, and not just for beginners. Also, as I said, for maintenance or for development of additional skills for those who are more experienced. So a, a nice approach, I think, that will add to that um, opportunity for our managers to continue to develop and hone their skills. And then finally, a lot of work going on around recruitment. You know, one of our priorities when you think about the 
major institutional priorities for the future is to really do a better job with recruitment and support for recruitment. One of the things that we, we know that we've struggled with in the past, while we may be able to describe pretty well what a working environment is like and you know, who, a co who colleagues might be or what the set of colleagues will be for a particular individual or position, we struggled a, a little bit, we've struggled a little bit in terms of describing, well, what about, what about your personal life? What are the options? What about choices for where to live? There are a lot of choices now, on the island, off the island, uh, sort of a city suburban field versus more of a, a neighborhood field, uh, older homes versus newer homes, schools with all different sorts of credentials. How do we put credible information out there for potential employees to access so they can make good decisions about where they might like to live. Well, Pep Valdez and our colleagues, his colleagues in marketing and communications have developed this UTMB Living website. So I've asked him to demonstrate it for you just briefly. It's got some beautiful pictures about the different neighborhoods that, uh, where our people live. It's got a lot of information about schools. Um, the people from the Galveston Independent School District as well as the Clear Creek School District gave us uh, some of the common metrics, if you will, some of the things that they show to parents who are considering uh, relocating to their school district. So it's got what we think is very useful information. It actually divides out by county and by zip code, so you can navigate, navigate by map, you can look at public schools, you can look at higher education opportunities, and again, uh, housing, as you'll see here, uh, with different photo support and the like, so it's a really cool development. I'm, I'm just really pleased with the outcome of this. Thanks to Pep and colleagues for developing this, and we'll continue to work on it. It's out there at that UTMB Living website. Uh, and so just about anybody can take a look at this and we'll put this into play uh, for use with all of our potential employees in the future. Thank you. So good work from our HR folks, also doing an incredible job to support our major strategic efforts and the needs of our employees. A lot of great work occurring all across UTMB looking at how we make day-to-day -day task uh, more efficient, how we can reduce cost overall, how we can do what we do better. A couple of things I wanted to point out, because people ask me when I go around and talk to different groups, what about reducing costs? It seems that things are just so expensive and getting more expensive. Are there significant efforts to reduce cost? Yes, there are, all across UTMB. The lean tools being used, Six Sigma sometimes, just a local look at workflow to try to make sure we're as efficient as we need to be, that we're focused on the things that make the biggest difference relative to our task. Here's a couple of the big savings uh, groups have, that have accumulated over the course of the past year. Our supply chain group, uh, led by Frank Rygard, has done just an amazing job at working with people in the health system within the academic enterprise to achieve some significant savings, over $6 million in operational savings generated through the end of February 2014. Um, looking at ways that we can improve on that number over the course of time, but great work with that. Just looking at the use of electricity, our utility bill, Mike, is 30, what million? Over 30 million a year now, and of course that's a huge number for us. And so we are considered one of the most energy efficient campuses in the UT system, but that's not enough. We want to continue to look at ways that we can be more efficient, generate energy savings, and things like instituting the LED bulb program has saved us a significant amount of money. We've reduced electricity usage by about, uh, what is it, 3.4 million kilowatt hours, so that's enough to power 1,200 homes. It's a nice comparison. That saved us about $200,000 in operating cost, and in addition to that, we've gotten another 200,000 in energy use reduction rebates. So a lot of really great efforts here, understanding 
that we're in a challenging time relative to revenues and fund, uh, funds coming in to support our mission work. So it's very important to continue to look for savings where we can find them to continue the effort to become more efficient. So nice work to both those groups and to everybody. Congratulations and thanks to everybody who's working to help us become more efficient all across UTMB. All right, so talking a little bit about financial results, this is just a quick roll-up of the numbers through the halfway point in the fiscal year, the end of February. We've got uh, the actual numbers in this column, the budgeted numbers in this column, the percentage variance here, uh, oh, excuse me, percentage variance here, the actual variance in terms of overall dollars here. And so here's our operating results up here. So operating revenues, operating expenses, our operating income or loss here. Then we've got the non-operating portion. So that includes our general revenue distribution from the state, our interest income here, or excuse me, investment income here. And we generate a contribution margin, depreciation, bottom line. So I know everybody's skipping to the bottom line. How are we doing? Well, remember, we've got about a $1.7 billion budget overall, and what we plan to do from a financial standpoint is break even. We want to come in around zero, a little positive this year. That generates a cash flow of about 90 to $100 million, which enables us to continue to invest in the future, and we can basically afford to operate. And we're just about there halfway through the year. We're a little bit worse than budget. We were planning to be about $3.4 million above the break-even point at this point of the fiscal year. We're about $200,000 below, so we're about $3.6 million off. And, you know, on a $1.7 billion budget, that's okay. Now, we obviously would like to do a little bit better, and we're looking at ways we can do better, and we think we can get to that little bit above zero, a little bit positive by the end of the year if we continue to manage well. But essentially, we've been doing our, this. This is akin to the performance that we've generated over the past several years, and it is consistent with our plan. So while the results are not perfect, I'm pleased. I think we're managing very well. Now. Uh, Michael Shear and Celia Bailey and others will tell you, well, when you look at some of these big roll-up areas of operation, our net patient revenue is a little bit, uh, certainly ahead of where we were last year, but a little bit behind our budget. We budgeted pretty aggressively for growth this year. We haven't quite hit our budgeted targets, but again, we're ahead of last year's performance. Our grants and contracts revenue is a little below budget and below last year. Well, remember, we had the government shutdown for several months, and so that pushed everything back. We think we'll be close to budget by the end of the year. We have a significant amount of money, um, revenue, that's planned associated with the Medicaid waiver DISRIP projects. Some of those have been delayed. That has a financial impact. We're almost $10 million behind in that budget, so that's responsible for a significant variance. But we've got a plan to move back closer to budget. The good thing about that program is that if you do achieve your outcomes, you still can uh, get that revenue. So we're working to do that as we go forward. We think we've got a pretty good chance of making that happen. Now, our operating expenses are running pretty significantly below what we planned. We're managing very well. We're offsetting those um, reductions relative to budget by operating at a, a little bit less expense than we had planned in our budget. That's okay. Um, a couple of other adjustments here in terms of depreciation, Hurricane Ike activity uh, have been favorable. So overall, um, again, we're doing okay. We just need to continue to manage well. We certainly don't foresee any major financial crisis through the end of this year and into next year. So that's all good news. So I mean, coming back to the overall, you know, when I talk to groups outside the institution, I talk to them about the mission of an academic health center. What sets us apart? What is it that we're supposed to do? Well, it really is transforming healthcare. And we do that through the three parts of our mission, training the healthcare workforce of the future, doing impactful research that over the course of time 
makes a difference in terms of improving diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease, and delivering cutting-edge, state-of-the-art health care, but in the process, helping define what comes next. It's not enough just to be state-of-the-art. What places like UTMB, uh, UTMB do is figure out what is the next state-of-the-art and start moving the system towards that. And I think we do all three of those extraordinarily well. So what are we going to do? How do we get to that future? What does it look like? What does that mission work look like in the future? Well, for us, we think it is continuing to grow our student population. You've heard me say before that Texas is vitally short of health professionals. And that shortage only grows as our population grows in the future. And our population now is growing faster than that of any other state. So that gap can be magnified if we don't respond. So it's important for UTMB to think about that, to step up if we can to produce more health professionals who can step into that gap and serve our state residents very well. Um, our faculty who are involved in research are doing marvelous work. Uh, if you go out and you look at the utmb.edu slash newsroom, you'll see the spotlight on research, which talks about the incredible work of our faculty members, some of the recognition we're receiving, and we want that to continue in the future and want to make sure that we can support that well. Um, thinking about how the health system should change, not our health system, but the health system across the country. How should we, how can we work together more effectively? Can we create new models for working together, new partnerships that allow the existing resources and future resources of America's health system to function better? Can we leverage those more effectively? And again, with the partnerships like Angleton Deanbury, like we have among those of us participating in the Medicaid 1115 waiver, we are creating those models which we think point to better ways for the future. Clearly, we have a responsibility within the state, certainly within our region of the state, for caring for the growing population. And then finally, improving health and health care, all of these things go into that equation. How can we make health, good health, and health care more accessible for every member of the population in Texas? So how are we doing? Well, we are growing our enrollments. We just looked at the numbers the other day. Over the course of the past five years, we've grown our enrollments by almost 30%. Think about what we had to do right after Ike. That's when we started the enrollment growth. Our deans, our faculty, our staff members have responded incredibly well. We've been able to grow our enrollments, again, aimed at reducing the shortages of health professionals in Texas. Our research funding has been very stable in a time of incredible and increasing competition for research uh, resources. Our faculty, our staff who support research have extranded, uh, responded extraordinarily well, um, increased the competitiveness, uh, competitiveness of UTMB overall, and, and made sure that we didn't suffer significant losses in terms of research funding. We continue to grow our clinical service lines. We continue to try to respond to that growth in population out there. We've done specific marketing to let people know about the expertise that we have available at UTMB. And bottom line is we continue to generate financial outcomes that are consistent with our plans. So I think we're doing a very good job in terms of managing what we're supposed to do in creating outcomes that are consistent with the charge that we have as an academic health center. So, you've heard Ms. Sollenberger, Dr. Jacobs, and me talk about moving forward, emph uh, emphasizing the integration and alignment in education, research, patient care, and institutional support, becoming more focused on priorities, more focused on the ways that we truly make a difference um, for the people of Texas, expanding our collaborations, um, responding well to increasing accountability and competition for resources, not only in research, but in education and in patient care, 
providing value, increasing the value proposition for our students, patients, and key stakeholders. Thinking about what health and health care in our country needs to look like in the future and playing the appropriate leadership role and moving us in the right directions. And finally, creating the strategic partnerships that will be necessary to be successful uh, in the future. So again, I, I think we're on the right track. I think we have good, solid plans. I think that uh, we're, we are living up to our responsibility as an academic health center in Texas. So coming back to vision, what do we want to do? Well, work together to work wonders. That's an essential part of our culture. We work together as well as any group of people at any academic health center in the country. And I think you can expand that latter phrase to say just about any organization in the country. Our people work very well together. We understand our role and responsibility as an institution, our roles and responsibilities as individuals to help define the future of healthcare. And of course, I think just about everybody who works here comes to work every day and wants to be the best at what they do. And when that's the case, it helps UTMB become the best. So I, I think we, are, we, are, we have the right vision and we're doing everything in our power to realize it. So as we move forward, we understand what the road ahead looks like. Now, I do think we have an opportunity to better translate that vision for the future into individual vision statements for each of us. So we want to make sure that everybody understands their role, how they contribute as we go forward. So this concept of my road ahead, what does it look like for UTMB? What does it look like for me? And how is UTMB helping me be prepared for that future? What development opportunities are out there for me and what's the plan for me having access to those opportunities? So we're gonna to continue to push on that front as we go forward. So again, we're all about defining the future of healthcare and just have some closing video clips that go along with those that we started with this morning that describe a bit about how Tim and Bernadette and Charles and Laura and the others you saw are thinking about how they're contributing to defining that future. We want to lead the way. We want to be the trailblazers. And we want to set the example and set the bar high. I mean, I've gotten phone calls and emails from other customers of Epics who have wanted to pick my brain because they heard about something we did and they wanted to implement something along those lines at their institutions. And, and we've gotten phone calls from Epic, you know, the vendor site that saw something we did and they want it for them. They want it for their system. They want to be able to share it with all of their customers. And it was new for us, um, new for them. So I think we kind of learned together. UTMB is evolving. Sometimes you can't go forward without looking back. When I first started here, flying out to other communities and telling them that there really was a, a medical center in Galveston that people didn't even know about. But it's kind of like a hidden gem. And now you can see how we advertise and we're putting up all kind of uh, clinics up on the mainland and building a hospital up there. The most exciting project, actually it's three of them, they seem to have a huge life of their own, is Jenny Seeley Replacement Hospital, CSW, and um, the Victory Lakes expansion. Each one of those are a little bit different, but they are going to be some neat buildings. Um, I, I feel really great about seeing the new Jenny Seeley Hospital under construction, seeing it come to fruition, um, and what it will mean for healthcare in Galveston and the surrounding area. Um, but to see the investment that the state has made and all the hard work and dedication that it's taken to get to this point really um, is a bright future for the university. Being a native Galvestonian, probably one half of these buildings weren't here when I was a young kid, uh, driving through here on my way to uh, Little League practice. So to see that progression, not only from the outside looking in, but being here and being a part of it is extremely encouraging and uh, gives me great confidence that UTMB will be here for another 100, maybe 200 years.
All right, thank you all, and thanks to all who participated in the videos. Any questions for me today? Again, what we've tried to do and what we always try to do with Mondays in March is to give you a picture of um, how we see the world today relative to UTMB's plans from our roles as the executive leaders of UTMB. I'll tell you what we're seeing on the horizon for the next few years and begin the process of helping you translate that into how or what's going to happen for you and your colleagues. And then following that, we continue to come around and talk with as many groups as we can about how it's playing out. How's it really working? Do we have the priorities right? Um, are we doing the right thing so that we truly are defining that future of healthcare? So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for participating. Thank you for allowing Dr. Jacobs and Ms. Sollenberger and me and other executive leaders to come around and spend some time with you. We want to continue to do everything that we can to make sure that we all work together as well as we can. Questions? Comments? That's it? All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>